Hello bearded bee people. Welcome back to the B and K's Bees channel. Uh, this is the first of our winter bee discussions. I will probably have a catchy name for it figured out before I upload this video, but I've not figured that out quite yet. So right now I'm just going to call it winter bee discussion, episode number one. Uh, the most talked about, and if not, it should be the most talked about topic in beekeeping is the varroa mite. I'm not going to go through uh, in very much depth into treatments or management methods but I am going to talk about the biology and the life cycle and various aspects of the varroa mites uh, parasitic abilities that we can exploit in treatments and in management methods. So I just feel that there's uh, you're better equipped at dealing with the problem overall when you have a better understanding of what the problem truly is. So let's get started. You can't have an intelligent discussion about keeping bees without mentioning the varroa mite. They're seemingly ubiquitous, biologically and physically virulent, and constantly changing enough to develop resistance to treatments. With all of the problems that come with them and all the different opinions <clears throat> on how to deal with them, I think we should arm ourselves with a deep and thorough knowledge of exactly what they are before we can make a truly educated decision on how to combat them. Varroa destructor evolved as a parasite of Apis serrana, the Asian honeybee, and it only made its way to Apis mellifera, the honeybee we know and love, the European honeybee, uh, when bees were shipped to eastern Russia or Asia sometime in the early 1900s. Apis mellifera had no natural defense against this new pest, and havoc started early and spread rapidly once these infested European honeybee colonies were brought back to Europe by amateur beekeepers in the Russian army. Through various methods of transfer that we will go over later on in this video, an increasing and an increasingly migratory nature to the business of beekeeping, the varroa might spread across Europe and Africa, bringing with it destruction and disease. Despite efforts to quarantine the United States against this prolific parasite, in 1987 what was then mistakenly identified as Ver varroa jacobsoni was found in the states of Florida and Wisconsin. Beekeepers in the United States and Canada were not prepared for the invasion, and despite efforts to stop the spread and repair the damage, the varroa might spread rapidly across North America. Varroa destructor is an ectoparasite of the family Varroidae, genus Varroa. For years, it was mistakenly identified as its genetically similar cousin, Varroa jacobsoni. After genetic analysis, however, it was found that Varroa destructor and Varroa jacobsoni are different species and differ in 6.7% of gene sequences. Adult female mites are dark reddish brown, elliptical in shape, and 1 to 1.8 millimeters long and 1.5 to 2 millimeters wide. Adult male mites that you'll never really see because they're only in existence for mating and they rarely, if ever, get out of the brood cell. The adult male mites are smaller and yellowish in color, measuring 3 quarters to 1 millimeter long and 0.7 to 0.9 millimeters wide. The eggs, once again, you're probably never going to see them, are, but they're whitish in color and they're approximately 0.2 millimeters long and 0.33 millimeters wide. Eggs are difficult to see because, once again, they never leave the brood cell, and if you are looking into the brood cell, they kind of blend in with the... Uh, larva jelly, the brood food. There are two distinct life cycles that adult female mites undergo, phoretic and reproductive. During the phoretic stage, the mite feeds on the hemolymph, aka the blood, of an adult bee, escaping the bee's regular grooming activities by attaching between segments of the bee's abdomen, usually on the underside, so don't ever try to rely on browsing the backs of bees for mites. Don't ever take that as an indication that you don't have mites because the phoretic mites are probably on the underside of bees and the foundress mites are under capped brood cells and impossible to see. The phoretic stage usually lasts between 4 and 11 days but during broodless periods like winter this stage can last multiple months. The longer a mite stays in the phoretic stage, the greater reproductive capability it has when it enters a brood cell to begin the reproductive stage. That's probably a direct correlation to the amount of nutrition that it's pulling from the adult bee. The reproductive stage begins when the mite leaves the adult bee and enters a brood cell that is about ready to be capped by nurse bees. Drone brood cells are preferred by mites due to the extra space and the longer period of development of the drone compared to either workers or queens. 
Drone brood takes 24 days to emerge compared to 21 days for workers and between 16 to 18 days for a queen. The preference of drone brood has led some beekeepers to pr practice drone brood removal where a section of drone brood is removed from the hive when all of the cells are capped. When the mite enters the brood cell, it is known as the foundress mite. The foundress mite first hides under the larvae, breathing through the jelly using constructed tubes called paratremes. After the brood food is consumed, the mite attaches itself to the larvae and starts feeding, and shortly thereafter lays its first egg. The first egg is unfertilized and will develop into a male mite. The subsequent eggs are fertilized and will develop into female mites, and those are laid every 25 to 30 hours after the original one. Both sexes of the mite will develop into adults between six and seven days after the egg was laid. The amount of time it takes for a European honeybee larvae to develop into an adult bee is crucial to the varroa mite success parasitizing Apis mellifera, as the development from larvae is slower than that of Apis serrana. After molting into adult mites, the mating begins. Unless more than one female mite entered the brood cell before being capped, male and female mites are forced to mate with the siblings. Male mites' mouth parts become hollow tubes that are then used to inseminate the females. The mated female mite will exit the cell after the bee emerges, starting the phoretic stage. Studies have shown that when adult female mites leave the brood cell, it prefers to attach to nurse bees over foragers and young bees versus old. Some think it has to do with the repellent nature of geraniol, which is a component of the Nasanoff pheromone that the foragers emit. Others are of the idea that the nurse bees offer better nutrition for the mite. The effects of the varroa mite on Apis mellifera are numerous and varied. There are direct effects from the result of the feeding of the mites on larvae and adult bees, and then there are also viral diseases transferred from mite to bee. There are numerous honeybee diseases and viruses that can threaten the health of a colony, and the majority of those are either transmitted by mites or the bees' natural immunities are weakened by the mite, allowing for viruses and diseases to take hold and do more damage than it could without the assistance of the parasite. Viruses are microscopic genetic packets consisting of DNA or RNA wrapped in a sheath of proteins. Viral particles cannot, cannot multiply outside of a host and require some type of interaction between hosts to transfer. This is where the mite comes in. The varroa mite can act as both a biological and physical vector for transmitting diseases and usually infects the bees when feeding, which injects the viral packets directly into the bee's circulatory system. There are direct correlations between varroa mite levels and the levels of deformed wing virus. In heavily infested colonies, levels of bees infected with DWV can climb to 100%. The varroa mite acts as a biological and physical vector for transmitting this virus, meaning it can replicate the virus in itself as well as carry it on the mite's surface from bee to bee. A 2013 study done by the Bee Informed Partnership showed that 80% of tested colonies had some level of DWV. Symptoms of deformed wing virus can include deformed wings, shortened and or misshapen abdomens, inability to fly, and early death of the pupa. Deformed wing virus can result in death of the colony and is often mistaken for normal winter losses. Acute bee paralysis virus is a common virus in honeybee colonies. The levels of viral particles that a hive can endure when transmitted from adult bee to larvae are high, therefore most infected colonies with low mite loads show no symptoms. When ABPV is transmitted by mite, however, the bee's threshold is lowered greatly due to the fact that the virus is injected directly into the bee's circulatory system. Infected colonies with high mite loads will often die within one season. Like ABPV, cashmere bee virus becomes mortally dangerous to a bee colony when transmitted directly to the circulatory system by mites. Without intervention, a colony infected with cashmere bee virus by mites will die without showing any overt symptoms. There are studies being done on more than 20 honeybee viruses and the varroa mite's effect. Whether a disease can be transmitted by the mite, however, does not decide whether the disease is affected by the mite. General immune defense is weakened by the mite's feeding and can often be the difference between a normally innocuous infection and colony collapse. Aside from the viruses and diseases that mites transfer, they have a direct impact on the bees they parasitize. Depending on how many foundress mites enter a brood cell, the larvae may die or be born significantly underweight. The underweight bee will have poorer flight performance and a shorter lifespan. Bees parasitized as adults can have phys physical and physiological problems, sometimes showing a lack of ability to navigate back to the hive. Another aspect to mite infestation that eventually causes colony collapse is the timing of the population peak. 
Since bee and mite levels, if left unchecked, increase throughout the year, the timing of the royal mite's population growth causes particular problems to the beekeeper attempting to overwinter their hives. As the summer's end nears, the queen starts to slow her egg laying, gra gradually reducing the size of the brood nest. This reduces the hive's population just as the mites are reaching their peak in population for the year. As the last of the winter bees hatch, the mites emerge as well, causing the year's highest ratio of mite to bee, just as the bees are entering an already perilous winter. This causes many beekeepers to question their overwintering strategies, blaming the cold or moisture for a collapse that was mainly caused by the aptly named Varroa destructor. This is called a phase shift, when the mites peak is just after the bees peak, and uh, you can have a colony that was doing so well throughout summer into early fall that will die before Christmas because of this poorly timed um, population interaction. Mites can move from bee to bee and hive to hive in numerous ways, many of which are exacerbated by human intervention. A phoretic mite can transfer from one bee to another in times of interaction on a flower, during robbing, drifting, or during swarms. Founders mites and eggs can be transferred to new hives when a beekeeper takes brood from a strong hive in, a, in an attempt to strengthen another or when equipment is reused on another hive. Mites can transfer from region to region through swarming, absconding, robbing, or through beekeepers transporting their hives. Beekeepers have developed many methods of managing varroa levels, including miticides, acids, essential oils, and management techniques. The only thing I preach when it comes to varroa mites is to breed selectively. Whether you choose to treat with oxalic acid or apistan, small cell bees, or brood breaks, the only thing that you can do to help the overall picture is to select the bees in your yard that deal with varroa mites the best, the ones that need the least assistance, and propagate from them. When varroa mites were introduced in 1987, many experts thought that the feral colonies would perish quickly and completely, but they didn't. We have the ability as a collective group to breed the varroa into insignificance. We aren't all Purdue University, but that doesn't mean we can't be an agent of change. Keeping a tally of mite numbers in your hive can be essential to finding the queens worthy of propagation. Relying on visual inspection for this can lead you to a too little too late scenario. For more accurate numbers that give you the opportunity to manage accordingly, you are left with methods like the sugar shake, alcohol wash, and sticky board. They all have varying levels of accuracy and damage inflicted to the hive. I won't describe these methods here, but for a good place to look for a detailed description of these methods, please visit Randy Oliver's scientific beekeeping site. There will be a link in the description. I did not mean this to scare you away from beekeeping or to persuade you at the end of this video to fo follow my methods of varroa management. I only wanted to inform you of the honeybee's singularly most dangerous foe. My feelings on the treatment debate are not yet fully formed. I like to consider myself a realist, but in reality, at heart, I'm an ad idealist. I think that sticking to this goal of building a better bee through selective breeding will eventually be the end to this problem. We cannot treat the mites into extinction. We don't have access to all the honeybee colonies in the United States, let alone the world. So being an agent of change and, and trying to create a genetic difference in these bees that allow them to be sustainable and hardy um, is eventually going to be the answer to this problem. So it's on us all to breed selectively and to keep a tally of our mite numbers so that we're not taken by surprise and so that we don't inflict our neighboring beekeepers with mite bombs. But try to stay positive. There are a lot of good methods out there for you. Like I said, you can get your mite counts through various methods that Randy Oliver discusses on his website. And you can stay on top of those numbers and be proactive and have healthy and happy colonies while we are all working our way toward building that better bee. So if you like this video, click like. If you haven't already, click subscribe. It's winter now, but I'll say it anyway. Get out there and have some fun with your bees.